Welcome everybody to the Virginia Institute of Neuropsychiatry. I want to talk to you today about MRI and mild traumatic brain injury. And by way of introduction, I want to tell you why it's important to understand magnetic resonance imaging or MRI in our patients with traumatic brain injury. Uh, and to give you an idea of why this is important, let me tell you about a typical patient we have here at our clinic. Uh, this patient was in a motor vehicle accident, may have been driving on the interstate, may have been hit by a big tractor trailer or another car, and they had a mild traumatic brain injury. Um, they may get a CT scan at the emergency room that day, it's read as normal, and sometimes uh, patients like this a month or two later have an MRI scan, which is high resolution, but that's also normal or unremarkable. And so, but this patient's still having chronic neuropsychiatric problems, trouble thinking, depressed, trouble sleeping, pain. Uh, and the question comes up, was this patient really injured? Is there any objective sign of injury? Well, I'm gonna tell you today why measuring brain volume in our patients using MRI uh, can sometimes show objective signs of injury. And to give you an overview, we're gonna cover two major sections in this talk. First of all, I'll give you a brief history of structural brain imaging, CT scan and MRI scan. And then we'll uh, talk about some modern techniques for measuring brain volume in our patients. A little bit on the history. In the 1970s, we had major breakthrough in technology with the development of computerized tomography scanning. This was the first time in history that we were able to do a scan on a living human being and look at the structure of their brain uh, and we were able to see bleeding in the brain and um, other signs of damage which were very helpful for diagnosing and treating our patients. Then in the 1980s we got magnetic resonance imaging brain scans which is a different type of technique. Gives you somewhat similar pictures, cross-sectional images of the head and brain. MRI was, uh, has a higher resolution, that means the pictures of the brain are clearer we could see more fine detail and help us diagnose even more problems in the brain. Now, um, it's important to know when you learn about this area that radiologists who interpret these CT scans and MRI scans usually interpret them based on simple visual inspection. That is, they, they just look at the images, one image after another, and they're trained to determine if the brain's abnormally small or if there are other lesions or signs of injury in the brain. And, you know, up until, pretty much up until very recently, um, and I would say even, even to the present day, if you're simply using the visual inspection, you're able to see signs of um, brain atrophy or shrinking of the brain in, in most or all patients with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. But if you're studying patients with mild to moderate traumatic brain injury, usually the radiologist or anybody else for that matter, really can't see signs of brain atrophy or it's uncommon to be able to see it in patients with mild to moderate brain injury. That's been a major limitation. Fortunately, we've been able to overcome that with some modern techniques. And this has to do with the actual measurement of the brain volume, quantifying the brain volume so, so that we can measure any possible shrinking. And this was developed in the 1990s, uh, mainly in research laboratories, uh, universities around the country and the world. We're all very excited about that. Um, the problem was that that wasn't being translated or, or transferred to regular clinical settings so that um, doctors like me could use it in everyday clinical practice. So to summarize the, the state of MRI brain volume measurement uh, up until about the year 2000, first of all, we knew clearly from a lot of studies uh, in patients with traumatic brain injury that traumatic brain injury causes brain atrophy, which means shrinking of the brain. Um, and that's been very clearly shown by a lot of studies. Probably the biggest pioneer in that area is Dr. Aaron Bigler. The brain volume measurement up, up until about the year 2000, early 2000s, was typically done with a human being sitting at a computer 
using computer assistance to help draw circles around regions of the brain or borders of the regions, uh, and then the computer would do the actual me measurements. It was a tedious, laborious process to measure uh, a person's brain volume and the, vo uh, and the volumes of multiple brain regions. It would take, on average, about 15 hours. So time consuming, that means expensive and not very practical. Therefore, the brain volume measurement was limited to university and research settings. This situation improved around uh, the early 2000s with the development of computer automated software. Uh, one of the foremost techniques in this area is called FreeSurfer. FreeSurfer, as the name implies, is free. It's available to the public. It was um, developed at Harvard uh, and associated institutions uh, with funding from the National Institute of Health and other organizations over a several year period. And to show you what FreeSurfer does, we have here a coronal cross-sectional MRI of the brain. So this image goes through about the middle of the brain in this plane of section. Uh, it's as if we're, we're looking at the patient face on. And on the, the left side of the head, um, well actually that'd be the right side of your image is the person's left side of their head. And on the left side of you, the image you see would be the person's right right side of their head as if they're looking at you. And what FreeSurfer does, it's uh, the computer software automatically takes off the skull and the meninges, the outer coverings uh, over the brain. It then um, inflates the brain mathematically in the computer um, as if you're blowing air into it. Uh, and that makes it easier to measure the deep foldings of the surface of the brain, which are called sulci. And then it inflates it further into a perfect sphere, uh, which helps with to simplify the mathematical part of the brain measurement. And then that patient's spherical brain now is mapped onto an atlas brain, which has had the same procedure applied to it. An atlas brain means there was a human brain uh, for which an atlas was created, and um, scientists went in and identified every region of that brain so that we know where the regions are. And when the atlas brain was inflated to a sphere, it's overlaid with the patient's brain. And so now we know which of regions of the patient's brain uh, correspond with which brain regions. And then the whole process is reverse engineered. The patient's brain is deflated back to its original shape. And voila, all the regions are uh, automatically identified by this um, pretty neat uh, software. And by doing this, we're able to turn an image that looks like this into one that looks like this. We can see the brain regions identified, and they're colored various colors. The cortical gray matter is colored a, a rose color. The thalamus is colored green. The cerebellum is colored brown, and so on. And not only does it measure the vo uh, not only does it identify these regions, but it also allows us to measure the volume of these regions. Now the limitations of FreeSurfer are that, first of all, it's not available for commercial use because it's developed in the public domain and uh, although it's free for people to use, it uh, is restricted from being uh, able to be used commercially. That means I can't use it in my clinic where I see patients uh, and medical centers uh, around the country, other clinics can't use it in their clinics either. So it's great for research but it's not good for um, clinical settings. Okay, now another part of this story uh, that developed in parallel with FreeSurfer and uh, the MRI work has to do with a, a study called the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, which is a multi-site study in the United States performed across the 2000s. Um, it's been going on for several years now. It's a very well designed study to look uh, at brain volume and other things in patients with Alzheimer's disease over time. And we were interested in using their data because they've collected a lot of MRI data not only on Alzheimer's patients but also on normal control subjects. And we were interested in using the data from the normal control subjects 
so that we would have a normal database to compare our brain injury patients to. And their MRI data are available in an online database uh, that we obtained access to. And we took that data and measured brain volume in those patients. Next slide. Okay, and this approach was also used by a company called Cortex Labs. And they used both the work done with FreeSurfer and with the ADNI or Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative uh, study to um, create a software product called Neuroquant. Neuroquant was approved by the FDA in uh, 2007 to measure human brain uh, MRI volume. It is based on FreeSurfer and basically it's the computer automated uh, analysis portion of FreeSurfer that can measure brain volume. And it is commercially available. Uh, that's a big advantage. That means that clinics and hospitals, and including our clinic here, can use it. We can uh, charge patients to do the work, and that means we can afford to do the work, and, and it's practical in our setting. 